You're listening to Accents, a radio show for literature, art, and culture. I'm your host, Katerina Stoykova, and my guest today is poet, teacher, amazing human being, Kathleen Driscoll. Hi, Kathleen. Hi, Katerina. Thank you for having me. Welcome to the show. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Always a pleasure to hear you read your work. Well, thanks. It's... Um... It's always great to be with you too. You're such a marvelous poet in your own right. And I, I always appreciate being invited and uh, uh, you're just, you're a wonderful advocate for literary arts in, in the area. So thank you for all you do. Thank you. Kathleen Drisco is chair of the Spalding School of Creative and Professional Writing and current chair of the board of the Association of Writers and Writing Programs also known as AWP. She is the author of five poetry books, most recently Next Door to the Dead and Blue Etiquette. She was also my uh, poetry mentor at Spalding while I was uh, going through the program. So I One of my favorite students. Thank you. you. You've done well. You've made us look really good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. I... Uh, Keep on quoting things that I have learned from you mm. um, and from my other uh, Spalding mentors. But this is not about me. It's about you. What have you been writing these days, Kathleen? Um, I'm, as usual, I have three or four projects going at the same time and I'm moving back and forth. I think it's a little difficult to concentrate these days. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and so I don't seem to be doing a very focused job of writing, but I'm actually writing more uh, poems about my flood subjects, which are mortality and um, religion, atheism. Mm -hmm. And I'm writing some poems about that sort of encompasses all those uh, about friendship. I'm trying to write some poems, which I've been wanting to do for a long time about my friendship with uh, the late poet Claudia Emerson, who was a, a wonderful friend of mine. We met on the first day of graduate school when we were getting our MFAs at, uh, in Greensboro many years ago. And we just, you know, sometimes you just meet people instantly and you know, this is gonna be an important friendship for me. And it was for many, many years. And, you know, she died a few years ago and uh, rather young in her late fifties and, uh, and so I'm, I'm still trying to work that through. It's, it's hard to lose a, a close friend. I don't know that I ever have lost a friend that, with that sort of intense relationship. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on that. So those are, those are things that I'm doing right now. I'm working on some craft essays. I'd like to put together a book of craft essays um, that are based loosely on my lectures and my teaching. And I'm also working on a, a memoir. I'm calling it a lyric memoir, but um, I don't know, it may be in verse. Um, it, it may be converting itself from uh, lyric CNF to verse right now. So those are some of the things I'm doing. So Our projects have their way of slipping between our fingers and morphing into other things. Yeah. And they have this inconvenient uh, habit of taking their time yes well i know that um i was just talking i did another interview uh, a couple weeks ago and they were asking me about my poem uh why i mother you the way i do which is a poem that's uh in cedar cross snow i think i think it's in cedar yes, cross yes. Snow. and and uh that was a really important poem to me but it was about something that happened to me when I was in high school and I had full faith having thought about it over the years that it's one of the reasons that I became a writer. And I was, um, I tried to write that poem for many years, but I just, you know, uh, had to wait 20, 25 years before it came in, in uh, delivered itself in a way that I was satisfied with. So, um, and, I, and I am satisfied with it. Um, it's an important poem for me, so. I would love for you to read a few poems for us, Kathleen, as many as you, as you would like. Okay, well, why don't I start off with that poem since I was just talking about it. So. I can find it here, sorry. It should be well-worn. 
I wasn't expecting to read it, but since I was just talking about it, I thought I would. So here we go. Um, okay, this is called Why I Mother You the Way I Do. That afternoon, I had to admit, there were no thoughts of you. I was in high school, making my way past the buses to a waiting car, a boy who would not be your father. When the line of traffic stopped, the girls, classmates, sisters, had darted between buses and into the highway, trying to cross the field to their home. They both lay twisted in the road. My science teacher, Mr. DeSaro, took off his suit coat and laid it over Susan's face. He was crying because he only had one coat. By the time they let us pass, Eve had been covered with a white sheet. The ambulances had come. Red lights flashed, but their mother was still pushing her silver cart through the grocery. The sheriff was walking up behind her. As she reached for a gallon of milk, he moved to touch her arm. So um, that poem merges a couple of things, um, but it had to wait for my daughter, my 13-year-old daughter, to throw a tantrum about not being allowed to do something that um, she thought she should be able to do before I was able to write that. So um, I think I'll, I'll read a couple of new poems um, that I've been working on. So I will read um, the, one of the poems that I've written for Claudia, and this is called River Walk in Winter. Overhead, the sky is as ragged as the chicory blue of spring, which is, I suppose, the world's way of saying unexpected color remains in the January landscape. It's our job to look, to keep looking, even on the brown paths next to the shallow river crusted in ice. All is quiet here this morning. It's too cold and early for runners though their kids are already in the yellow buses on the roads over there, beyond these woods. No one is walking a dog, yet most dogs would be here happily, despite the wind. In the year or so before she died, when Abel, she'd walk in a park along a path next to a river and try not to think about cells dividing and growing, so odd to think of growing in the negative, especially now, in winter, I mean. She was loved again, and she loved him. She loved dogs too, but she grew so angry, she said, she needn't have, I heard the rage in her voice. When they came bounding toward her off their leashes, their owners walking casually behind them, expecting everyone to be as delighted as they, that they owned such marvelous creatures. I feel compelled to defend her, to say again, she loved dogs, to make sure that you heard me. She loved all animals, really. She loved the whole damned world. So maybe it was, as those dogs bounded toward her, they made her realize just how easily then she could be bowled over. But really, I think it was the injustice that got to her, that some followed all the rules, yet were punished anyway, and sometimes in the worst ways, and sometimes next to the river, crusted with ice. So I've, I've also been um, writing a little bit about my home again. Um, I don't seem to be able to leave that. It, it, it continues to fascinate me. So, um, and, I, and snakes, for some reason I'm writing about snakes. So this is a poem called Eve and uh, it's like Adam and Eve, not like the evening, so, Eve. We finally know it's spring here when I'm heard calling out, God damn it, 
having just been startled by a snake sliding through tender grass, tail flicking one last quick flick as it slips under the planked porch. Once I was lopping off Annabelle hydrangea blooms big as my head from the bush out back and brushed one with my hand as it lay coiled inside. And once I was clipping the boxwoods near the fence and discovered one twisted casually like tossed Mardi Gras beads throughout the little gems of green leaves. And once we pulled out the dead refrigerator to find one behind it, a shriveled length like a mummified twist of ancient grapevine. And once near the little pond, I watched one eat a live frog, the wadded hump of it moving through the snake, like one's hand slipping into a long evening glove. I made half dozen trips down the sidewalk to the trunk of my car to bring in bags of groceries and each time walked under a fat rat snake creeping across the tightrope of electrical wires until it disappeared into the tunnel of our home scutter. But not before nearly flop flopping off the back two feet of it swinging loose threatening to drop across my shoulders. But what would you have me do? Go without grass, water, flowers, food, April air? Would you have me never step out into spring? So those are some new pieces that I've uh, written. I'll, um, I think I'll re read one more. Oh, let me. Let me move to something else for a second. So this is kind of a companion piece for the, the last couple of poems that I think I'll read. This is uh, from Blue Etiquette, my beautiful book from Red Hen. It's such a beautiful job on it. And this is called Uncleaving. This is another poem that um, took me a long time to write. As my kids were were little when the situation of the poem happens, but um, you know, this is published just a couple of years ago. Uncleaving. All summer I watched for him. I knew he was out there inside the rimming of woods that ran all around. Wild boy, feral curls, stiff and ashy with dirt. He paddled, pedaled past at least once a day on his rickety, rusting bicycle, grocery bags dangling from crooked handlebars, his filthy sleeping bag tied to the rear fender. One neighbor said she saw him washing dishes at the Waffle House near the exit ramp. Another called the cops, but no one ever found out what he was hiding from or why. Though I tried to stay alert, he always approached quietly, giving me a start while out front pulling weeds near the picket gate. Each time he appeared, my heart revved up in faster time, my, gut, my eyes anxiously searching for my small children nearby, digging happily in the dirt with old spoons. All summer, he must have lain in the woods, awkwardly tending his fugitive camp trying to slow his own heart, leaping up with each odd bird call or snap. In the night, I'd wander from window to window, watching, making sure his flame had not caught hold of the horizon. I buttressed for danger instead of worrying over him like a good mother, instead of extending him any kindness if only in my mind. So many ways my children have cleaved my heart tenderly toward the world. In so many ways, they've turned my grisly core against it. Um, I think I'll finish up with um, the last new poem. 
This is called Poem for My Grown Children. The poem, this poem refers to another poet's work. Uh, Kevin Prufer has written a poem called Seeds. And it's one of my talisman pieces. Um, it's not difficult to find on the web if anyone would like to look it up. It's just a gorgeous poem. I never get tired of reading it. And it's always uh, sort of heart thumpingly thrilling to, uh, to look at it each time I do. So this is called Poem for Grown Children. In a poem I love, the husband slices open a pepper to find a church. But here at the sink, I found a house and inside the rattling seeds of a chandelier. It doesn't make any difference. My beloved is also alone in the hospital. And in our home at the window, I stand alone for the first time in almost 30 years. Then my husband had rushed out into the dark summoned to his father's deathbed. But I wasn't really alone. My toddler son slept, his mouth slightly open and red and wet inside like a fledgling's. My daughter grew within me, close as a locket on a chain. When my husband returned, I remember he talked of the rattle the death rattle. The children are now inside their own homes asleep, curled around their beloveds, but all so young yet, they do not think we will ever die. In their garden beds, if they're dreaming of seeds and light, we are dreaming of little blazes growing hotter. They are not dreaming of wind and flickering and certainly they are not dreaming of smoke. Wow, Kathleen, these are wonderful. They're gorgeous. Oh, thank you. When, yeah, well, you know, you always love the poems you're with, right? So um, uh, thank you for saying that. They are very yours. All of them are very yours. You know, I hear the Kathleen's voice, and they speak to the things that you normally speak to, but in a different way, from a different place that you yourself are at. That's that's how I hear them. Yeah, I, uh, yes. I mean, I I don't really vary too far away from my subjects, but you know, I'm always trying to find new ways to tell things. I don't know that in these there are. Um, any ways that are too out of the ordinary for me, but I, you know, I also like to find historical ways to talk about things. I remember in Next Door to the Dead, when um, I had this eureka moment early on, I didn't know what the project was when I was writing about it, but um, writing about the, the little graveyard that's next door to our house and with some very old graves in it. But I soon realized um, that, you know, focusing on that, half acre of land and the stories that could be told there, I could tell anything I wanted to. So um, I could talk about anything. There are poems about domestic violence in that collection. There are poems about, there are anti-war poems. There are poems that are um, anti-racist poems, you know, um, poems about mothering which you know, I seem to come back to again and again. I was talking to someone the other day who was saying, I'm so glad you're still writing about mothering because it seems to sort of, I don't know, those poems are not necessarily what are in the zeitgeist right now, but I, I still maintain that, that that's one of the most, if not the most important subject um, that most of us can be writing about. So I'm, I'm not about to give that up. Here is a question I ask all my guests who teach creative writing, and that is, what is the most important thing you teach your students? If there is one thing you want them to remember from your class or your workshop, what is it? Um, well, the thing that immediately leaps to mind is the idea that 
um, that form and sense have to go together and that no matter how we draft poems, I also say that, you know, we draft things, most of us, I believe, this, this may not be true of everyone, but generally I think we draft things very quickly and sort of with an unconscious bent, you know, just pulling, pushing things out. Um, but we also, when we go back to revise, which is for many writers, the most fun, um, and maybe the mark of a, well, I don't know, this sounds kind of obnoxious, but maybe the mark of a real writer is a writer who loves to revise and, and tinker and play around with things, but um, that we have to really bring all of our consciousness to that the revision process. And so we may not know exactly what the form is when the poem is coming out of us in that, those first drafts, but it's up to us to go back and try to figure out figure out how, what, what sort of form the poem is asking for, because that's what's so marvelous about poetry, isn't it? It's the, the fact that these two things, I mean, generally things are changing and things are blurring, but generally prose, we expect prose to look a certain way in, you know, paragraphed. And of course we might have white space and now we're working in lyrics. And so um, they might look a little different than traditionally, but poems, um, poems, we have so much freedom to shape poems. And, and I think the way they look on a page is, is the first introduction, obviously, that the reader has to them. And, and so it should say something too. And maybe it says, maybe it says, I maybe am not a, a true sonnet, but I kind of look like a sonnet. And so I am trying to evoke those relationships between a sonnet and what I have here on the page. Um, or maybe it has, maybe it's a poem that needs a lot of air in it. And so it looks a little different on the page because there's more white space in it, but, but that should not be a shtick that a poet falls back on. Um, I do think there's an inclination perhaps of, for people to pick a particular shape or keep returning to it, but that doesn't mean that's the only shape that's available to a poet too. So, um, yeah, I think that's really, even though we're writing about serious things, that's really the poets are always at play with the language in that way, trying to figure out the visual and the, 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 the oral and the meaning and, um, you know, how poems work, not only in a horizontal way, you know, we're taught to read, in, in this culture, we're taught to read from left to right, right? But we should be reading, we should be dipping down and reading vertically as well, too. And sometimes that's where we find um, the hints or the clues that we need to shape our poems in a particular way, sensibility. So yeah. I'm rattling on, Katerina. I don't know. <laughs> no, this is great. And I have one more question for you. Okay. And that is, what is teaching to you, for you? What is teaching for you? What is teaching for me? Yeah, what does it give you? What has it given you? What does it mean to you? Because um, you do it with, you know, I've seen you do it with all your heart, teaching and teaching about teaching. And I know it's important to you, but I want to hear how you would speak about that. Well, I don't know that I could, I, you know, I don't know that I have one little pat answer for it, but I, I you know, I do know that um, in my life, every good thing that's happened to me has happened through connection with another writer. And I want to help other writers create those connections too. Um, and I, I think, you know, teaching is connection, conversation, community. I think that human beings are made to make things. And because, because we, we create things, and we have an impulse to create things. Um, we also have an impulse as, as human beings to um, work with language and work with our imagination. And for me, not to sound too highfalutin about it, but if this is the way that a, a if this is the art that the student that a student wants to pursue, I want to do everything I can to help that student become 
fulfill his or her own potential because it means that that student is fulfilling his or her or their humanity yep. too. So I really think that this is, this is, it's a way for humanity to be better, really. Poetry is a way for human beings to think on a level that's necessary, but we don't often do to create on a level that's necessary, but we don't, I want people to have this sort of safe place to come in and, and really dig down and play with those important ideas and to fulfill their humanity, their full potential as human beings. So. Thank you so very much, Kathleen, for coming on Accents and reading poems and talking about things that are important to you and to us and to, our, to other writers. More for me to quote. <laughs> okay, good. Well, it's always great to be with you. I appreciate this. And thanks for all that you're doing for everyone. Appreciate it, Katerina. Thank you.